It was clear to both the Western Allies and the Soviet Union in the final months of World War II that the destruction of Nazi Germany would bring tension, if not outright conflict, between them instead. As far as the victorious Stalin was concerned, the devastated Soviet Union deserved the spoils of war. An estimated 25 to 40 million Soviets had died, depending on the sources cited, and vast tracts of their land had been devastated by the war against Germany. Stalin also clung to the old Russian belief that Russia was a mother country, entrusted with the protection of the Slavic people of Eastern Europe. Particular sticking points between the Western Allies notably the British Prime Minister Winston Churchill, and Stalin included the state of Poland. The Soviet dictator had promised to hold free and fair elections in Poland, but it was instead obviously being made into a Soviet satellite. By the end of hostilities on May 8, 1945, Soviet armies occupied Eastern Europe to a line extending from Eastern Germany in the north to Central Austria in the south. However, in April of 1945, worried about Stalin's future plans, Churchill had approached the Joint Chiefs of Staff Committee and ordered them to prepare a plan for the use of military force to bring Stalin to heel. It was stated that the overall or political object is to impose upon Russia the will of the United States and British Empire. Operation Unthinkable's optimistic objective envisioned a swift military success using British Empire, American, Polish, and even German troops, ideally ending in Stalin's capitulation to political demands, mainly the end of his occupation of Eastern Europe. Necessary preparations for the attack, including troop concentrations, road, airstrip, and communication network repair and construction, as well as many other factors, would have been immediately obvious to any Soviet agents and reconnaissance. The eastward offensive was proposed to begin as early as July 1945, due to the intent of US forces to demobilize and evacuate Europe as quickly as possible. A primary armored clash would be started east of the oder line and in the area between Stettin, Schneidemulle, and Budgosz. One factor limiting Allied land power was the promise to police occupied territories such as Germany, Italy, and Austria, a commitment which required 11 divisions. This was compounded by the extra 25 divisions needed to defend the front line from the Baltic to the Adriatic. After subtracting these divisions from the total, it was projected that 47 Allied divisions would be able to launch the assault in the North area. 14 armored divisions, 25 infantry divisions, 5 airborne divisions, and an additional 3 equivalent divisions, to be specified later. Opposing them would be the titanic and battle-hardened Red Army, who, it was projected, could muster the equivalent of 140 Allied infantry divisions, 30 armored divisions, and a further 24 tank brigades. In short, the Soviets would have a numerical advantage on land of about 2 to 1 in armor and over 4 to 1 in infantry. While it was predicted that a massive land war would be the dominant theater, sea and air power would also have to be taken into account. The Allies had almost complete naval superiority and could easily control the Baltic Sea, allowing it to strike Soviet ground installations from aircraft carriers, and also giving them the capacity to support any land operations along the Baltic coast. In the air, 6,714 Allied tactical and fighter aircraft, in addition to 2,464 heavy bombers, faced 9,380 Soviet fighters and ground attack aircraft, in addition to 2,380 light bombers, 1,000 strategic bombers, and 1,100 naval aircraft. While the Red Army Air Force was massive, it had weaknesses which the Allies predicted would render it useless for a prolonged war. The Red Air Force depended on the West for almost half of its aviation fuel, a large portion of its aircraft construction material, such as rubber and aluminum, and also possessed an inferior radar system. A further advantage that the Allies did not count on was the fact that Stalin had begun a purge of the Air Force's high command depriving it of effective leadership, similar to what had befallen the Red Army before the German invasion in 1941. 
On the tactical level, while the Yak-9U fighter and Tupolev Tu-2 bomber that the Soviets possessed were of high quality, they had a relatively low amount of strategic bombers, no experience in carrier warfare, and no experience in attacking high-altitude bombers, such as the American B-29 Superfortress. If the results of the massive initial surprise attack were favorable, the new objective would be to stabilize the line of advance from Danzig to Breslau, a distance of 240 miles. Planners believed that if this was accomplished by the autumn of 1945, it might be enough to bring Stalin to heel. If Stalin did not change his mind about the fate of Eastern Europe, the Allies would either have to retreat or push into Eastern Poland and into the Soviet Union itself, an act which would likely bring about total war, a third world war. In this nightmare scenario, a mass mobilization of forces in the United States would have to occur, in addition to forces drawn from the recently defeated Germany and the other Western allies. In order to attain victory, the Allies would have to conquer the large metropolitan areas of the Soviet Union, so that they would be deprived of the manufacturing bases for weaponry and ammunition. In addition, a simultaneous and utter defeat of Soviet forces in the field would be necessary. Either one of these goals was incredibly implausible because, even if the Soviets did not just block the Allies' advance outright, the Red Army could easily and swiftly withdraw across Eastern Europe and into their homeland, consolidating defense positions without suffering a major defeat, in effect replicating what it had done to Hitler and his armies. This type of attack would be made even more difficult because the Soviets had already been required to move their manufacturing bases east of the Urals during World War II, and Allied planners now paled at the thought of the enormous distances their forces would have to penetrate, a fact which the appalling state of Soviet roads did not help. Planners also had to anticipate Stalin's possible countermoves, such as invasions into Scandinavia, Greece, Turkey, and more crucially, the oil-rich Middle Eastern countries of Iran and Iraq. It was a combination of this far-fetched operational feasibility, war weariness, and the general lack of public support that made this plan obsolete. We here at the Cold War will discuss what happens next, so subscribe to the Cold War channel and press that bell button to get the updates. We rely on our patrons to create these videos, so consider supporting us via www.patreon.com slash the Cold War. This is the Cold War channel, and we will catch you on the next one.